Well, I'm so delighted to be here. I'm happy. I'm happy. Who's happy today? I'm very happy today. Thank you. I'm happy because it's a beautiful thing to feel at home at Unity's home, uh, the center here of all that happens in the Unity movement worldwide. It's a wonderful privilege. I know it and I feel it and I thank you. And I especially thank uh, your ministerial team here, Reverend Aaron, Reverend Marianne, Reverend Jackie, and all of you guys who are reverends and irreverends. You know, thanks, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, I want to begin by just telling you where I stand today. For today, I will accept the truth about myself. I will arise in glory and allow the light in me to shine upon the world today. From A Course in Miracles, I'm going to say it again because I sure need it. Today, I will accept the truth about myself. I will arise in glory and allow the light in me to shine upon the world today. And here's what I know about it. It ain't easy. It ain't easy, as Kermy said. It ain't easy being green. It ain't easy being the light of the world. Anybody join me in knowing that? <laughs> I have not met a human, fellow human on this planet to date that thinks that's an easy job. And yet, it's our mission it's the prevailing mission. And I take my mandate from Charles Fillmore, who actually said it is our mission. Here's his words precisely to the degree I can remember them. It is your mission to express all that you can imagine God to be. Let this be your standard of achievement. Never lower it. And never allow yourself to be belittled by the cry of sacrilege. Hmm. Think about that. Why we fail to be the light of the world? People will think, who do you think you are? And Charles Fillmore said, it is, if it is possible to God, then it is possible to you. You can express all that you can imagine and in fact, this is your mission. It's no small thing to take that on as a personal mission, but that is precisely where I stand today. And my beloveds, my husband Giles, my daughter Alicia, my son Adrian in Orlando, they know it's not always easy for me. And yet, I persist. I persist in the attempt every day to the degree of my conscious awareness in that day. How about you? Yeah, yeah. I think there's reasons why we find it so challenging to just stand in that, to fulfill that mission. Because it sounds so nice, doesn't it? It sounds like well, sure, who doesn't want that? Is there anyone you've ever met who doesn't have a longing to express more beautifully in the world, to be a greater version of themselves? I've not met a soul to date who doesn't stand there, whether they're acting in a healthy way to get there or not, right? It's a perpetual human longing. It's built into us, this longing for greatness, this longing to shine, this longing to know we are divine. It's built in. And yet we've, yes, thank you. And yet we've been conditioned, have we not? I mean, our life has given us some patterns. I was thinking about my life and, you know, I'm a real good example, just a, a common example of how challenging it could be. The, where we grew up and how, what the messages we received as we grew and how we learned or didn't learn to be audacious as the light of the world. Divine audacity. You know, common audacity rightfully asks, who do you think you are? But divine audacity, that's, that's something else. That's 
Charles Fillmore saying, don't worry about being called a blasphemer. Shine anyway. Shine your light, right? So I was raised in a, in a very protected environment. I was raised by an Italian Catholic family. My two parents were adult children of alcoholics, and their way of coping with that was to be very firm. I would call it rigid. <laughs> I would say I had very, very high discipline as a young girl, and the predominant message I got was that I must be a good girl. So I was a very good girl. Disobedience was never even a question in my mind. So I learned to conform to the family. I was one of seven kids, and man, we all had our place, and I knew mine. I knew what I was to do and when I was to do it. I knew how to behave and how not to behave from the earliest days of my awareness. And I grew in that and my my teachings by the good sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary enforced that. <laughs> so, you know, good girl. I was good girl. I mean, that was about the strongest thing I could say about myself. I was very proud of being a good girl. And the one mistake my parents made when I got to around puberty was they let me out of the house. <laughs> Because I promise you, the minute I got out and got out beyond my own neighborhood with my other Italian Catholic friends and their families as my only world, I began to learn something. I went up to a girlfriend and I said, did you know that there are families that do not eat macaroni on Tuesdays or fish on Fridays? Seriously. It took years, it took college years for me to discover that there was not just one true religion. And that led me into the pursuit of all the great possibilities out there, and that's when I got into a lot of trouble. I found a yoga class, and I felt myself a little yogini. I became a yogini. I went home to my parents at the age of 19, and I said, I'm moving to an American ashram. I had my, uh, my sari on. I had the little tea lock, the little, the little red dot in the middle of my third eye, and I was walking around chanting Hare Krishna in their house. They didn't know who took away their daughter. You know, where did she go? It was so strange for my parents. And, and it was easy for them to think, well, Linda's just, you know, bucking authority here. No, 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 I wasn't bucking authority. I was following authority. Because they had done a good job of teaching me to be a good girl and to follow. But I learned through my yoga practice to follow my inner guru, my Christ nature, to follow the urge to express in a greater way. A few years after that, um, I returned home and, and, and had an announcement that I was very concerned about making to my parents uh, because I had had some experience with it in my family. Uh, I enacted for my family our very first occasion of, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> and that was quite interesting uh, because my father renounced me when I made that announcement. It took my dad nine years of absence from my life to harmonize that for divine love to work in his heart. Nine years. And again, his thought was, I was just kicking him in the pants. I was just, you know, blasting all of his values. It was the furthest thing from my mind. It was divine love in me that was my urge, that was directing and calling me to live a greater life of love in a package that I wouldn't have expected when I was a little girl in a sheltered community. And then, years after that, I did like the most blasphemous thing to my parents. Nobody in my family had a, had a way of even digesting their daughter, their sister, brother, cousin being 
a minister? I didn't have the right anatomy, anatomy to be a minister in my family, right? It was so strange to them. So I have found through life that that audacity, if I allow it, if I accept the truth about myself and I allow the light in me to begin to shine, I will do things that other people consider very audacious, quite natural to me, quite audacious in the eyes of others. And yet it's the only thing to do is to shine in the way that that inner direction reveals for us, right? Are you with me? Yes. Any audacious beings out here? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, come on. Thank you. <laughs> so here's what I know that it's not always easy for us, first of all, to see that we are divine because we see this, we see the crust, we see the edges of our own body, we see ourselves separate from one another, we see, you know, that we're a good human doing walking around. And so it's a real challenge sometimes even for us to get the glimpse of who we really are. But one image really helps me with that. And I want to show you that image today uh, on the slide ahead. First of all, the first picture I want you to look at is this. Can you see this? What does it look like? A rock. It looks like a rock. What does it look like? It looks like a rock, does it not? It looks like a rock. Does it look like rocks you have seen? You've seen these kinds of rocks in the hillsides, up in the mountains, up in the, in the hills in San Antonio, we can see them. But there's something special about the rock, right? This rock, when you crack it open, looks like this. We call it a geode. You know what? The, in, in the field, in the field, this is known as the Tootsie Roll Pop of geology. For a very good reason, right? Because it looks just plain on the outside. I mean, you walk around planet, did anybody ever tell you you weren't human? Well, maybe jokingly or maybe because they were upset with you, but really, don't you recognize in every human being, you see human, do you not? We all look alike, you know. And yet, crack you open, and what happens? There's the shimmer and the dazzle and the unique patterns of divine light in you and in you, and in you, and in me. Each one formed uniquely and yet recognizable as a shimmery geode, different colors on the spectrum. This is my reminder to myself that just because I can't see it in the externals of my life doesn't mean that I'm not it. And when I'm willing to get a glimpse on the inside, I begin to see that all the panorama of divine attributes are all there in me. What Charles Fillmore called the 12 powers, which are highlighted and illuminated in the book Divine Audacity, that's what's on the inside of every single one of us. It's not something we have to go in search of, it's right there, when we just open ourselves to see on the inside. Isn't that a beautiful way of looking at it, to understand the truth about ourselves, to come to admit it and to accept the great truth about ourselves? Whether or not it's always easy, it is the truth. So how beautiful that we have an opportunity in every day to renew that desire, that longing. We have this inbuilt longing to know our dazzling nature. And one of the greatest practices in a unity way of living, which is what attracted me to unity and why I urge you, if you're fairly new to unity, to begin to study, to find a class, to come and participate and get to know your nature in this way more and more. 
because as we come to accept it, now we can allow it, now we can show it more often, and it becomes more natural to us to let the insides out, so to speak, right? But there's a particular practice that I like uh, to help me with this, and that is to be able to look at the externals of a person or of a situation and to penetrate with my spiritual eyes to a deeper knowing. In other words, to not only look at the externals of that person, but to see what's going on inside. And I find that as I do that, I become more audaciously able to do that for myself. Sometimes it's easier to find that love and that faith and that power in someone else. Do you agree? Sometimes that's a lot easier. But I find if I do that enough with other people that I begin to shine the light of that back on myself and I can help myself tremendously. So a little exercise I'd like to ask you to engage with me in is to gaze deeply with me for a moment. So there's a picture here. Can you see this picture? I don't see it so well from up here. Uh, hardly any of us in here probably does not recognize this image. This is a picture of, of Dr. Stephen Hawking, the great physicist and cosmologist. So imagine you never had seen his picture, and imagine you're on the street, and he's on the street, and you're looking at him. How easy would it be to miss Dr. Stephen Hawking? How easy would it be to feel sorry for him and to see there a broken body? And yet, when we look, when we know, we understand that this was a person who audaciously decided he was not going to succumb to invalidism. And that wasn't his path. That there's a light to shine that he knew. It takes a little audacity to bring that out in a body that is challenged to communicate it. And yet, Dr. Hawking has given us some of the most important information about our world and about ourselves as any human being ever has done. We see that now. Thank goodness he saw it. He knew it. So here's another picture for you. And this is another person in a wheelchair. That woman in the front in the wheelchair is my good friend, Cecilia Losi. Cecilia and I were YOU sponsors together when our kids, long, long time ago, when our kids were in high school. And she was lovingly known as the wheelchair lady because we would do universal dances of peace and she was twirling in her chair while the rest of us were on our feet. Cecilia uh, is in a wheelchair because of childhood polio. So her legs withered in that experience. Well, Cecilia, early on in life, was given the message that that was not to stop her. And so Cecilia became the woman that, uh, that the kids went to, that her grandkids go to. I remember visiting with her when she had a newborn grandchild, and she, because she couldn't get up and, and, and you know, lift the baby from the crib, she devised all these ingenious things. So she wrapped the baby in a blanket, and she'd pick it up with her one arm and then put the blanket in her mouth while she grabbed the baby with the other arms. She was remarkable. She found all kinds of ways to work around it so that she would not miss the experience of love with her grandbaby. This is a remarkable capacity that we have to adjust and to adapt and to do, to be unstoppable as the light of the world. No excuses, I say, because this is Cecilia in her Zumba class. So no excuses, guys, right? <laughs> so I'll just leave you with one more image, and this is very dear and personal to me. This guy sitting with his walker in front of him is Carmen Martella, my dad. 
So this is the dad who renounced me and who I didn't see for nine years. It took nine years for him to meet his grandchildren and his son-in-law for the first time. This is a man who, if you saw him on the street, he's just an old Italian grandpa. You know, he's just the, you know, he, he's, he's, he's just a plain old grandpa. Yet, I know something about this man. Here's a man who, as a former electrician, lights up the community wherever he goes at Christmas time. Because he made his Santa hat, his, chair, his uh, walker, and a tie, this gaudy tie and, and, and sweatshirt that he wears at Christmas, all filled with Christmas lights that just twinkle. And he walks in and says, ho, 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 wherever he goes. He, that's the heart of my dad. That very same man who renounced me has a heart of gold. You wouldn't know it unless you looked deeper than the experience of a patriarch who disowned his daughter. Right? So think about your own life experience. Someone who is, is so crusted over like a geode that you haven't seen the good in there. All I have to say is the word politics and you probably have some ideas, right? <laughs> Whoo! Yeah, yeah. Crack them open, guys. Crack them open as we crack ourselves open. <laughs> All right, so I want to say, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat after me uh, where I stand. And maybe you want to stand. Maybe you want to stand. Today, I will accept the truth about myself. I will arise in glory and allow the light in me to shine upon the world today. Phrase by phrase, today, I will accept the truth about myself. Today, I will accept the truth about myself. I will arise in glory. I will arise in glory and allow the light in me to shine upon the world today. Together, today, I will accept the truth about myself. I will arise in glory and allow the light in me to shine upon the world today. And so it is, and so it is. Thank you, everybody. So grateful.